for the reasons I mentioned, getting everyone together to get that buy-in. Uh -huh. that, is, that is key. And without it, and if you don't have buy-in, then people kind of stray, people may not um, believe in it, and they may lose interest. And that is not, um, that is not something we want to have happen. I, I want to make sure that we're all aligned together to move forward and, and accomplish that goal. But at the end of the day, if I'm sitting around a table and we have, um, you know, no consensus and there are 10 different ideas out there and nobody can agree on anything, then at the end of the day, it's the leader that really has to step up and make the decision. Uh, make the decision based on the information that's been presented to you, but at the end of the day, it's, it's up to you. Because if you don't make a decision and you continue to... Um, you continue to, to focus on getting more information and time goes by, people are wondering what's going on. It's called, you've heard it, analysis paralysis. You're just, you're not, you're not moving forward. At the end of the day, you got to cut bait, make a decision, and move on. And you know what? Sometimes it could be the wrong decision. But I am more impressed with leaders that are able to take that information, use their gut, make a decision, and move on. Uh, versus someone that just um, gets the alligator hands and says, "Oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not ready to do that. I don't want to be the guy that makes that bad decision and gets blamed for it." Mm -hmm. So I think that's real important because you need to stay nimble. You have to redirect all the time, and that's what you're paid for as a leader. Sometimes you're going to have to make the tough call, the uh, the, the unpopular decision, mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, that's what a leader has to do. Great. Now. As, as the director, you know, you're working with other businesses, things of that nature. How does risk and uncertainty affect your decision? I have uh, one boss that always tells me hope is not a strategy. So what that means is, well, we, we have to get information. We have to get a plan together. We have to understand what the obstacles are and minimize that risk and minimize that uncertainty. Um, if we just go out and say, oh, well, I hope we're going to make our goals this year, well, that's, that's not going to cut it. We need to know what's out there and then form a plan based on that and execute it. Okay, great. Planning. So, so what is your planning process? <laughs> <laughs> planning process. You know, planning happens, I think planning happens every day. Um, uh, one boss told me one time that we have to think of ourselves as being water going down a stream. You know, a, a stream just starting out has, um, has a direction, it's moving along, there may be a rock in the way, but that we consider an obstacle. How do you move around that obstacle? How do you move around and keep flowing, keep moving ahead? And, and that's the plan. So a plan, um, you know, we work on our strategic plans. Um, a broad-based, high-level, 40,000-foot 40, view plan is our strategic plan. We'll get together and, um, and talk about where we need to go. What's our goal? Where do we want to go? And then we create a, a road map to get there. Okay. And, and that's very important. But you know what? At the, the plan may change. The plan can change. New obstacles can come. New rocks could come in, in, in your way, and you've got to figure out a way to, to maneuver around that. So are there... Um, external forces out there that are causing you to change the direction. You've got to understand what it is, get info on it, get your intel, get your team together and figure out how we can stay competitive and move around that obstacle. So it's, again, the collaborative nature, employing everybody to, to get together and understand what the plan is and get their buy-in and move forward. So what I'm hearing is this strategic, it's this high level, that's pretty much like your first plan, you know, you're, yeah. you're, you're forecasting, you're, you're thinking ahead. How do you then take that strategic plan and break it down into like a tactile or operational plan? What we do is we encompass SMART plans. We use SMART plans, and um, that's an acronym for strategic, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So for one sales manager to, say, to go out and say, hey, I'm going to make a bunch of sales calls and I hope I make my goal. Well, that's not smart. Uh, we need to quantify it and qualify it. So if we look at um, saying something more like, I'm going to focus on the corporate market. I'm going to make 20 outside sales calls in the week of March. I'm going to identify 10 prospects, convert three of them into definite bookings for $50,000 worth of new business. That's a smart goal. And that's, I have them go out and create them, bring them back to me. We look at them together, and then, and then we move forward. We let them implement it. 
and that's very important. Again, that's I tell them, hey, listen, you're kind of running your own show here. This is think of it as your own business. Run it like you own it. What would you do to get to the next level? That's a great concept. Great concept. I, I like the analogy. Um, so most business courses um, programs always comes back to the SWAT. You know, the strengths, oh, yes. the weaknesses, the Absolutely. opportunities, and threats. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Your role in your business. It's, it is a tool that's been around for a long time, as you said, and I've used it for as long as I've been in business. So it really is helping you to identify your strategic plan. If you can take a step back, and again, using that 40,000 foot analogy, getting a high level view of where you are um, in terms of your strengths, what are you doing well within your company, weaknesses, um, what do you need to work on to stay competitive? Um, that is very important. The opportunities are external. What's out there in the, in, the, in the competitive set that could create new demand for us and how do we capture that? And then threats. Is there a new competitor coming online that we need to know about and could that change the scope of, um, of our business? How do we, and that's a, that's a great example of a rock that we need to navigate around and figure out how to overcome it. So it's, it's a great starting point. And you know what? Sometimes you can get, well, we already know what our strengths are, we already, but if you get a, t a team around the table, it just sparks new discussion and out new outcomes can definitely come about when you just start from the basic SWOT analysis. Yeah, it's a great brainstorming tool, it is. you know, and actually quantifying and putting on paper, you know, those different elements that meet each one of those uh, uh, legs of the SWOT. Right. Great. Now, now let's move to staffing. What is the value of human resources for both a company's human resource management department as well as its manager, one being yourself? Right. I believe that the human resource department is one of the single most important departments that a company can have. I think they have a finger on the pulse of who the, the, the people are in the company. They are not there to just um, hand out the benefits paperwork once a year. They're there to help and build our, our managers and build our employees and develop the culture that is, uh, is the company. They have the finger on the pulse. <clears throat> I also like them because there are a lot of people in our company that don't report to me, but human resources is a great um, liaison to... Um, to help these folks in terms of coaching and, and developing their leadership skills. And that is, that is, that's huge because sometimes for middle managers, there might not be as much training as for the sales because sales is top line revenue and we've got to make sure our salespeople are dialed in. But for the, the other operational managers, it's really important for them to, uh, to get the tools that they need to succeed. So I think human resources is hugely important for the success of a company. And for me personally, I place a lot of value on the department because they help me in finding the right talent, helping me um, get the right people on my team because hiring great people is hard. Mm -hmm. It is, it's, you, you, you kind of get better at it, but there are times when you need the help of another department to, uh, to run through situational questions and, and really get the best out of people or the best information out of people so you can make the, the best decision because um, it's, it's, a, an, it's, a, it's an expensive process to go through, the hiring process, because there's training involved, there's, there's, there's turnover. Thankfully, we don't have a lot of that, but when it does happen, it's like, you know what, I really want to focus on this and get the right person in the job because it's going to affect my team It's going to, uh, and ultimately affect the success of the hotel. So hugely important. Wow. So you talk about human resource being a resource mm -hmm. <laughs> to help you with uh, you know, hiring right people, training right people. Um, what about logistics, you know, legalities of, of matters? Do you find human resource department being a resource for that? Absolutely, because I don't know any of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I'm, I'm dealing with uh, an issue, I always go back to, uh, to HR to say, hey, are we okay here? Um, to, to make sure that we're, we're following the guidelines that our company set, set forth. So, you know, my focus is, 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 um, is sales, marketing, and, and driving business. 
but I may not know the uh, the legality issues of um, FMLA or maternity leave, things like that. So really uh, bringing them in as a partner to help me th- navigate through that is, is very important. Great. Well, uh, there are one last sector. Yes, sir. Talk about leading and controlling. You know, what are the conditions that can substitute for <laughs> or neutralize an effective leader? Leadership to me um, is someone that is inspiring, somebody, somebody that is um, motivating, somebody that is um, trying to find the best in you, and that somebody that believes in you so that you can get to the, be- to the next level, something we talked about, succession planning. I think that what can get in the way of that is someone that may be negative in nature, someone that may flat out lie, unethical. Uh, those types of things are, there's no place for that in leadership. Once you've done that as a leader, I, I, I don't, like I said before, I don't think you can come back from that. Mm-hmm. So those types of negative attributes uh, would just crush leadership because leadership is, is, is ongoing. It's every single day and it's, it's something that you need to focus on to, to, to manage your people and lead your people. If they're not inspired, if they're not motivated, if they're not happy, if they don't feel like they're adding value, um, they're going to move on. People don't leave jobs. They leave their managers. So it's something that you have to really focus on all the time. And those attributes can definitely spoil it. Uh, I, I like that, Daryl. People don't leave jobs. They leave their managers. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a great, great line to always keep in remembrance you know, as a manager. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I'd like to thank you, Daryl. You know, right. again, I'm Dr. John Beckham here with uh, Daryl Legere, who is the director of sales and marketing at the Hilton Hotels, and we'd like to thank you for your time, uh, for your valuable information, and I'm quite sure the students will find this uh, very advantageous to their academic aspirations as they continue on. Very good. Happy to do it. Thank you.